Uh, my name is Evan Douglas. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to acknowledge our generous sponsor this evening, Stephen Ehrlich, class of 1968. In addition to being the founding partner of the internationally recognized EYRC Architects in Los Angeles, Stephen has been a passionate and impactful advocate for his alma mater over many years in his important role as a valued member of my Dean's Leadership Council. I don't know if he's actually in attendance this evening for this lecture, although I'm sure he would love to be here. But I wanna publicly thank him for his unwavering support over the years in enabling us to bring distinguished architects from around the world on an annual basis to the School of Architecture. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker the internationally acclaimed architect, Tatiana Bilbao, a deeply creative, curious, and ethical citizen of the world, Bilbao has dedicated her life to the promise of architecture as a truly humanist endeavor. Genuinely concerned about the unsustainable consequences of our growing environmental crisis, as well as an increasing sense of alienation emerging throughout our contemporary culture, Bilbao is actively committed to an activist architecture that seeks to engender a productive amalgamation of symbiotic interests in the service of empowering people and community, communities from all walks of life. Fascinated by a more harmonious relationship between buildings and their natural surroundings, many of the projects overcome the traditional binary approach by blurring boundaries, celebrating the fertile abundance of flora, and overall creating spaces and environments that anticipate change as a valued anticipatory attribute in the making of meaningful architecture. In Bill Bao's universe, universe, notions of beauty, craft, and construction are inextricably linked together as a constellation of inseparable interests. The pragmatic forces that rain down upon every architect that are often deemed intrusive to the creative process are openly embraced in her practice as a network of productive resistance necessary in the natural process of design. Often working alongside local craftsmen and artisans, her projects draw upon native building traditions as interpreted through a contemporary lens, while also supporting regional economies. For Bilbao, it's about imbuing poetic imagination into the world, while also responsibly acknowledging the unique social cultural and economic context within which her buildings reside. Her brilliant practice offers all of us keen insight into a new model of engagement for the profession of architecture. Some few highlights about her bio, very impressive. Uh, Tatiana Bilbao E-Studio is a Mexico City-based architecture studio founded in 2004. Uh, prior to establishing her firm, Bilbao was an advisor in the Ministry of Development and Housing of the Government of the Federal District of Mexico City. During this period, she was part of the General Development Directorate of the Advisory Council for Urban Development in the city. Bilbao has taught at Harvard University, GSD, AA Association in London, Columbia University, GSAPP, Rice University, uh, University of Andres Bello in Chile, and Peter uh, Behrens School of Arts uh, in Dusseldorf in Germany. She currently holds an ongoing teaching appointment at Yale University School of Architecture. Her internationally recognized work ranges and scales from residential projects, social housing prototypes, pavilions, research centers and botanical gardens to large-scale institutional buildings. 
Her work has been published in the New York Times, A plus U, Domus, among others. Bilbao was named an emerging voice by the Architecture League of New York. Uh, she's also been recognized by the Kunstpreis Berlin Award, the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture Prize uh, by the Locus Foundation, the Marcus Prize Award, and most recently, a Tau Sigma Delta Gold Medal in 2020. The studio has had work featured in the Graham Foundation, Chicago Architecture Biennale, Venice Biennale, Museum of Contemporary Art Museum in Monterey, Museum en Perot, T-Space Gallery, Center Pompidou, and more recently, the Architect Studio Series hosted by Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. In closing, I, I thought I would share with all of you a quote which underscores her extraordinary gifts and social impact as an architect from Matt Mesner, a former Midwest editor of Architects newspaper and one of the jurors of the prestigious 2019 Marcus Prize, which is comprised of a $100,000 award and supported uh, by a design studio for students in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Uh, and I quote, uh, selecting one recipient was extremely difficult. But Tatiana Bilbao's work has something for everyone. Along with the complex social and cultural considerations, her work is formally and materially rich. She is an organizer, an instigator, and a thought leader in her native Mexico, as well as around the world through her teaching and practice. And with that, I would like to welcome Tatiana Bilbao to the School of Architecture at Rensselaer. Thank you. For me, these, uh, these, these past six months have been really um, uh, instrumental in the way that I'm seeing the future for my work. Uh, because I have, uh, and I said that um, COVID has been the least, but it has, and, and I'm not this diminishing uh, the pandemic, but um, it's been kind of um, a turning into um, uh, a, a very critical uh, position to understand how could, could we really, really, from the position we are, change things no and i think that uh, that is an exercise that i've been um it's painful but i've been very um enthusiastically working towards um towards wherever it takes me so i was explaining that in mexico there was um, a protest in november that for me was very important and representative uh the the women were fighting for uh, women's rights, but basically protesting because of the huge high rates of feminicides that are happening in our country. And uh, it is a social problem because it's not only the feminicides, it's obviously an incredible high rate of crime, cr crime that has been um, uh, increasing in the past 20 years and this is due to to the drugs and the social descomposition I mean there are many many issues behind and obviously with it it comes uh, feminicides as well but the fact that um, uh, nine out of ten feminine uh, out of women's murders are done by their loved ones says something so um, the, the women protested uh, in November and the protest was uh, I I interrupted by different destabilization groups that painted the monuments along the route that the women was, were passing. It was a huge march and there were huge damages in different monuments of the city. Um, basically paintings, uh, painting with graphite tie and these things, not, not much destruction. And the government, instead of responding towards the march or, or the protest, the, the, the real reason for what of, of, the, of, the, um, of the women's voice, uh, they really were angry because of the monuments. 
and this said a lot of the mood of the mood that we're living in no so um then obviously the movement increased in in importance and obviously a lot of more voices were uh, um, decided to join and the movement started to become very big and be a point of discussions in many points no a little bit of what was happening uh, in june and july with the black black lives movement and uh by march who was march 8th who was the international women's day in mexico uh we decided as a, a group of women architects in mexico uh, frida escobedo gabriela carrillo uh, rosana montiel some of them who you might know um we decided to participate in a lecture in a city called Oaxaca. Oaxaca is a city uh, that unfortunately is um, is the capital of a state that is very poor in Mexico and obviously there the opportunities and right for women are even worse. So I decided to accept uh, because of the of the relevance of it, but I also took the responsibility very, very strongly and I decided to be to re revisit my work in terms of uh, equality and discrimination and i was very surprised to find out that uh, in reality what i thought that i was uh, a responsible architecture towards others was actually not and the difficult part is that i realized that it comes from the core of it no if you think that an architect has the 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 idea that we can design places for others um even if you think or i think because that's how i've been trying to do my architecture since i started that i built for others and not for others only with uh, but being the other um uh and then you realize that not even then because you cannot be the other to build it uh, you are doing a practice that it's a coloni colonizing discriminatory since the core then uh, everything in at least for me everything on 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 my approach to how i do the profession changed and um so as i said it's been very revealing is i'm very enthusiastic about where where i i can go but it definitely is very hard because in a way you uh, we exist in these um in this world in this system that is a system that needs discrimination to perpetuate its uh, success so then things become hard from that point to go up but um i think it's a start when you re review the the um, the work with those eyes and i think that it's good that still when you have all these prerogatives in your mind you can open codes to understand how to incorporate your practice in a different way in the world, in the society that we're living in. So that day I, um, I gave a lecture that is very similar to what I'm going to do today uh, because I'm still in that moment. I'm still in the process of revisiting my work project by project to understand where we can change things, where can we put uh, the eye to really move from the ground um and uh, try to open channels to communicate better uh, with others to include more uh, in our process and to really build spaces that build e equality but also um, a more respectful environment socially culturally politically economically etc so um that day I was um, taking protest and uh, to at least uh, really um, uh, be critical enough during my uh, my work to uh, be able to understand how with that can I uh, can I do spaces that are that are more uh, inclusive and um, I must say and that was March eighth uh, that was the last trip I took. March 13th, we um, all um, went online and we are an on, basically online since then. Um, at least in the office, we haven't returned. Uh, we are an office of 65 people. All of them are home and um, we have been meeting um, 
not so frequently, some of us in the office, because on the other hand, it's been really hard to, uh, to include everybody in the discussions that we normally had in the office to make it a little bit more collective. So I must say that I, I don't like this, um, this uh, digitalization of anything. I must say that I believe truly in, um, in, 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 in us human beings as uh, being these public uh, um, um, animals that need the social part, the social interaction, the physical social interaction to exist. And I believe that we're gonna overcome this and I hope, truly hope that everybody can do uh, uh, a revision on where they are standing uh, because I do also believe, allow me to, to declare myself guilty of being that innocent person to think that um, we, uh, if each of us, uh, if we change, we can do a very big impact in the world. So um, discrimination is not something that um, is new to the world, you know, uh, that is, our nature as humans, as animals, we need uh, to, to really uh, discriminate the other in order to succeed in many ways. And um, we adopted that process as a very big uh, apparatus that uh, really holds our system, our actual system of everything. I actually believe that our, the rampant capitalism that we're living in, it really even increases that and potentiates the, the, the possibilities of discrimination. So I believe there are channels, although we, uh, we know that uh, discrimination exists since, since like it's part of our nature, uh, I know that they are possibilities of opening channels to, channels to really uh, understand how to eliminate uh, as much as possible but still be able to exist. Um, I think that uh, in terms of speaking about uh, women, I think that um, a, one of the key and instrumental factors for women's discrimination, like and the core of it, is the constitution of private property. Um, private property, uh, the concept of private property that emerged after the concept of nation state around the 13th century, especially in England, uh, I think it indicated the perpetual and problematic relationship between power and capital. Discrimination is a determination of the capital state. And um, moving fast forward and uh, making reference to Silvia Federici, uh, who is an incredible economist, if you don't know her, you should read some of her books, explains well enough in her book, Caliban and the Witch, uh, Women, the Body and the Primitive Accumulation, how discrimination towards women is determinant to the success of the capital estate. And um, as I'm gonna explain a little bit and very rapidly, how is this happening? When you uh, establish private property instead of communal property, which was before, uh, you, you are a, a, a minimizing the nucleus of people that can coexist. And therefore, someone of that group of people need to go out and uh, work for some money in exchange or to, to buy uh, goods, no? So it's very simple, the operation. Um, and normally what happens is women have to stay home because women are in naturally speaking, physically speaking, and are the ones giving birth. So it's easier, you know, since the 13th century, easier that women stay home and then men are the ones who go out and work for money to be able to bring the goods for the, for the family. Whereas before, a group of people would be able to produce uh, their own um, necessities, produce their own food, produce their own uh, system of care, uh, without the, the necessity of someone leaving the compound when it was a communal land. Uh, this, um, uh, at some point uh, in, in history, and I'm not going to go in detail because otherwise I'm, I, I could speak forever about how this became a process, is mo much more complex of what I'm going to explain. But um, 
the 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 the, the fact that the women needed to stay in the family and in a way uh, that began the institutionalization of nuclear family um, it is really the basis of uh, of discrimination beyond that there is a long history of uh, trying to perpetuate and to culturally uh, accept and even praise you know that role of women uh, in the household so uh, in the in the early um, uh, years of the last century of nine of 20th century there was this even kind of um, idealization of that way of life uh, by perpetuating the possibility of women and, and making their life easier uh, first with the Frankfurt kitchen and then obviously all that came afterwards all the incredible appliances to make housewives lives easier um, these obviously also created kind of the port portrait portraitalization of the ideal family that uh, nowadays is not only perpetuated by a system is also even being looked at and forward by a society which uh, obviously uh, it's it's obvious to say that it's uh, very hard to think that uh, that would be the ideal family uh, because it's almost impossible to achieve for the majority of the people. No, right now uh, numbers more and numbers less. I don't. I don't like very much numbers, but I read in a uh, somewhere that there's to only 25 percent of the population lives as a family, as a nuclear family, and the rest of the population lives in different configurations. But on the other hand, if you ha uh, if you held a, a, an interview, everybody would or the majority of the people, not everybody, there's a not absolutes in anything, um, a, only in life or death, <laughs> that's an absolute. Um, a, there, is a, there is a desire of living as a nuclear family in this perfect house with the perfect loan in the front a, a, in the whole world that has been perpetrated by media, but also by culture, but also by many other factors that have built our uh, imaginative in the collective that really perpetuate a system of discrimination that uh, makes then therefore really difficult to the search of equality. And I say it because if you even think of the system of private property and nuclear family also will uh, be a, a, a system that discriminates someone. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's, well, it, it does matter because right now it's only the women majorly, uh, but it is also someone of the family that has to stay home and has to stay home to do work that is the most important work, which is the domestic and reproductive work um, of the family without being paid. So uh, this really becomes a huge problem because if right now you we think that then we fight for equality women uh, will be working equally as men being paid equally who takes care of the children men or who you know so i think that we have to try to understand to speak in a system of care uh, that we are not speaking at all uh, and i think that a system of care would really uh, automatically start to be opening channels for not only a system of care of ourselves, of our uh, other, uh, of our neighbor, of our community, but also our environment. I think it is, you know, a stage relationship that would be beneficial and will really turn things to a virtuous circle instead of the vicious circle that we're living in today. So um, on the days before the International Women's Day, there was an interesting article in the, um, in the New York Times uh, stating that uh, the women's unpaid labor uh, per year uh, in the United States only is this number. I don't even know how to say it. I think it's $10,900 trillion. I don't know. Um, 
so high is the number of the uh, amount of money that the women, the unpaid labor, domestic labor, whoever does it, is, um, is not accounted in the economy. And I think I see this is a, a very pr problematic situation. Right now it's women in the majority of the cases that it's been doing this work. But as I say, the problematic situation is that if we don't value this uh, urgently, we are not going to be able to turn around things because right now it's women who is uh, doing work that is essential for us to live because without that work, we don't exist, point. Um, and if uh, it's never going to be paid, then there's someone that is gonna be discriminated from the system at, at some point always. So we have to understand how to change really the system from being based on a, a huge subsidy from the, the fact that the reproductive and domestic labor is not paid uh, to, uh, to really think that we can aim for a, a, an equal society. But I think that these, obviously what I'm saying, are huge issues that are not being able to be tackled by architect, by architecture. But I think that if we are all aware of it, we can understand how to embed in our projects um, a key, um, a key issues that could be, you know, uh, the base of many, many things that we can transform into spaces that would allow these things to happen. For example, I will say that right now, in this precise moment, we have not the possibility physically to transform that. No, we need to also transform our physical environment to be able to open those channels. Because in the, in the, uh, in the moment where uh, the possibility of taking accountants of the domestic and reproductive labor in the economy, uh, we need different co configurations of, of spaces for sure. And maybe we can start by that. So that day I said that um, I declared myself guilty be, because uh, it is very clear, and uh, you can also read Dolores Hayden, who has really written extensively about how architecture and urbanism, as we know, have become interest, those instruments um, for capitalism to systematically perpetuate the discrimination of women, at least in the economy. So, as I said, I declare myself guilty of being part of that system. And from there, I decided to start to understand what then, no? So um, why I'm guilty? I'm guilty of promoting consciously and unconsciously those spaces that really um, uh, classify and uh, entitle the, the, the definition of the nuclear family. These spaces are discriminative because when you have a house, that uh, the mo oh, even one of the most close spaces is the kitchen. It is impossible that you're able to create a system that would allow women to share that job at least with uh, not people, only people inside of the family, but others, no? And I think that COVID, what has done to us, has exposed those issues in a very important way. Um, because women, we do, at least I and I, I guess many of my, my fellows, we relay on, um, on public schools or schools uh, as a system to, of care for our children uh, to be able to work. No? And when you bring back uh, this to the household and have your kitchen in the middle of the house and you are uh, trapped in your house, well, I don't say trapped because I have the privilege of having a very... Um, nice place to live, but you are still trapped in this, uh, or you are in the house and you have the, the children here, you're not able to invite anyone else to be able to help with the, with the, all the, whole, the whole system of care to be able to work and have your children home. No, but I mean, COVID is just exponent, ex like explicitly uh, shouting how problematic the situation is, but this situation is problematic from the beginning, no? Um, I also declare myself guilty 
of not being able to disaggregate and disassociate the, the patriarchal discriminatory um, systems that are really part of our profession. I really don't understand them. And I really declare myself guilty of being a, of to be part of this capitalism system that not only discriminates, it generates violence, but also it destroys the environment, as I was saying. No? Um, I declare myself guilty of uh, being really overwhelmed by this fact, but I also declare myself self guilty of not surrendering and uh, really uh, trying to have always this internal fight with me to be able to uh, be critical enough to, to work within the system, but critically uh, towards another possibility. And yes, as I said a, a, a little bit ago, I declare myself guilty of um, fighting for this idealistic way of working uh, of, as, a, of um, a, and of thinking that the architecture can really produce a change uh, and can or could really start to be part of that change. And I really think, as I said, and I also declare myself guilty that uh, I am still one of those innocent persons in the world that I think that each of us, if we each of us do something, we can really make a very big change. I think that I also declare myself um, responsible on what I do and uh, I, I hold myself accountable on what I have done, but also on what I will do in the future. No? So I think that uh, right now I'm only speaking about this and I think it's uh, much more interesting if I speak uh, about the things that I think I can uh, do within my um, uh, realm and within my own projects than speaking about how we did something which I still think that right now, well, I, I do think right now is not so relevant. So how can we think of um, a, a, a possibility of opening channels towards uh, more equality in, uh, in the world, in the domestic realm? Well, I will start about questioning exactly what I was saying before the kitchen. Um, I think that uh, the, the kitchen is one of the core spaces uh, in, our, in our society, in our life, because it's where the, what nurtures us is being produced. Nevertheless, we, I don't totally think that it's necessary to have that in the, in the household. It is necessary that this uh, system becomes really more open and allows a possibility because that is the place of, uh, of, the, of the, actually where the care and reproductive labor starts. So I think that uh, by uh, uh, creating spaces that are able to be shared, we can uh, open the possibilities for, a, for more inclusion and, a, and, and, and way more um, care within each other, within, uh, within us, no? Um, I think there is a lot to learn about our communities, uh, rural communities, basically, and very much all over the world in the less, uh, in the more industrialized, more suburbanized world, maybe not, but in our country, there's a lot to, to understand. Kitchens are mostly collective, are communal. Kitchens are never for one single family. At least they serve multi-generational families that live in compounds. Um, they, there is a responsible person for this, and therefore there is an open possibility for many others to help to do it within different time frames. And I think that we have been doing lots of uh, projects where we are seeing that and also seeing it from, from the exterior. No? We already started to become a little bit critical on the situation of the kitchen when we designed this project in, um, for, the, uh, for, a, for a system which is called Vivienda Popular in Mexico, 
which is uh, a system that allows um, people that have no income or no formal jobs to have a house uh, subsidized by the government. And then there, there are a hundred models of houses in, uh, that the person is able to choose from and to build. And we decided to create a system instead of a prototype that would be chosen by anyone and be built wherever. We decided to choose a system that had more open possibilities. And one of the possibilities is to have the kitchen as a feature that it comes inside the household, because obviously we also need to understand that there's people that would like to have that still, uh, but also that as a system that is able to be put uh, in the exterior, just connected to, to, to the interior in one way, or not even connected, or a little bit farther from the, from the spaces of, uh, of living spaces, uh, in order to allow for these spaces to become different things no so pe some people uh, really transform the kitchen into productive spaces where they uh, serve others and they start to become a system a social economy uh, that really allows for many different types of care although it's still part of the economy uh, or others uh, transform it into uh, a storage a grain storage others uh, another type of productive space not directly attached to the product the production of food um, but i think that uh, by allowing the possibility of the understanding of the attaching the kitchen from the core of the house, I think we already create a step that allows many, many things. No, so in this case, this guy, this guy decided that it became became um, a little food supply store. And these in these houses that we built, or in this case, for example, uh, this woman really decided that this was part of the core of the family, and that she wanted to have it open to share it with their with their family members. No, so it depends. Uh, on your situation, but also on your moment of life, what do you want to do? But I think by fixing it in a household as if it was a necessary feature, we are uh, perpetuating this system that it's uh, not able to allow for different configurations. No? And we already have thought of this when we were asked to design the kitchen of the future. This was in 2014. And there was this uh, kind of exhibition done with different architects and we were one of the architects we were paired with a produ with a producer of kitchens and we already started thinking how the kitchen needs to become this space that is way more flexible no uh, first of all i think that the fact that it's completely attached to the construction of the house you know and then when you move house you sell the house you leave the kitchen there it's already a sign of uh, of have strongly it is set there, you know, and um, and for many reasons. Uh, one of the other reasons that we thought the kitchen needs to become a piece of furniture was also because of that. No, because that is part of your. Um, it's kind of the extension of your system of care. Can you bring it wherever you go? I mean, whenever you move. So we thought that uh, the first fact that we wanted to do is that instead of becoming a, a steady thing we only we designed this uh, furniture that really for us became the representation of the, the possibility of uh, just taking it to wherever you are so these uh, modules are on on wheels and they can be moved wherever and they can be placed however and you can take them um, anywhere no so even the the sink you can just uh, unplug the the a, a little um, two uh, tubes and plug them anywhere else i mean you need to have a, a water connection but the rest is totally movable without you having to plug in plug out you have a little tank gas for your uh, for your Oven, um, stove and oven and the counter uh, the everything else is just movable and we did that uh, as a project uh, so we did that for the exhibition and then we finally were able to do it in a project in this house this is actually a house <laughs> there's a house in the in the image um, although you don't see it because it has a reflective glass is in the in the forest where we decided to uh, have a space that uh, it, it is kind of an indoor out uh, combined with when you open the doors outdoor space of um, 
of a living space and a and a and a eating space, dining space, and uh, the kitchen is movable, so you can change the configuration for the kitchen. Um, this here you have some uh, storage space that it can serve for anything. You can store food, food, but you can store shoes. Uh, they're not classified, and then these. Uh, a, a furniture piece of furniture you see on the on the left of the image it's the kitchen modules that you can either use them there or anywhere in the place uh, but more potentially what we design it for is to the exterior if we're questioning the the kitchen i would also question the bathroom i mean when did we decided that uh, also again cleaning ourselves had to be in these uh, tremendous spaces, encapsulate the spaces that sometimes they don't even have a window. They are mechanically um, um, ventilated and they don't even have a window. So when did we decide that uh, this very important ritual of taking care of ourselves needed to become um, another, another thing? So when, where do we, when can we think that uh, this system of care, either of food or of cleaning our bodies, can become really something that is a part of our ritual, part of our everyday ritual, but also integral part of what we can really share with others and make it more as a community act that we bring us back together to create a system that allows us to have a reproductive and uh, care society instead of a productive one. Um, uh, this is one of the bathrooms of the house that I, uh, that I showed. And we actually haven't been able to take this step forward, but I think that in one of our next projects, we would like to explore in full this situation. What, what about the sleep? I think sleep is one of those very individual things that uh, need this very private space for reconstituting ourselves. No? So it is very important to have this very recluded, uh, secluded uh, space that would allow us to uh, have a strong uh, proper identity in order to grow social as we need it. No? So I do think that we need to think how important that basic unit is in, in society that we have not taken in accountants in reality. And I think that is one of the big issues uh, that COVID has exposed. Uh, a lot of us that probably all of us that we are speaking, that are here in this, um, in this room, because you already are linked to, uh, to uh, a, higher education, then that means that you have more possibilities than 90% of the world. 90% um, of the world have really not fulfilled their basic necessity of having an individual space that gives them the possibility of constructing an identity. An intimate space is absolutely necessary for our uh, for for ourselves to become, to have an identity, to have the possibility of be uh, to be uh, strong enough to have a possibility of represented, representing us uh, in, a, in, in a, wherever, no? within our inner circle or within our collective. And I think therefore we have to rethink what and how are we really as society going to pursue uh, in, uh, in these next years, no? in the future. Are we going to still pursue the idea that we need to be based on a productivity economy that really only creates this perpetual system of discrimination? Or can we really think that we need to change the basis? No? One of the other things that the pandemic has shown us, has shows, and I read it in a Charlie Hebdo um, quote, is that um, uh, the, 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 work, the, the people that are paid the less are the only necessary for, the, uh, for us to, to exist. No? So all the people that are moving food, that are producing and moving the food, and that are, produ and that are helping in the healthcare system are the ones that are truly essential to us 
to survive and are the only and are the ones moving through the city in these times in the cities that are shut down and uh, and they are the less paid in society no how is when did we arrive there when did we arrive to the fact that there's people for example in my country one of the biggest issues with the with covid is that the majority of the people cannot stay home and they cannot stay home, first of all, because they don't have a home that it really protects them. And second of all, because they need to go out and really earn money by selling unnecessary things to already in-depth uh, people to really bring food to their plates. So it's how ridiculous is when did we arrive uh, to the fact that people really need to go out and do superfluous jobs, unnecessary things, to bring food to their family first, and then to be unable to provide correct shelter for them. No? So I think we need to understand how to transform the, the, the idea of the, the most important values in society as being that of the production of a system of care that allows everybody to have an intimate space that is really protecting them, no? that is really allowing them to uh, become healthy human beings to be able to do anything else. In, um, in Mexico, housing is a, uh, a constitutional right. It is a human right declared by the U UN nations um, in the 40s but it is not a constitutional right in many of the major countries of the world, not even in yours. In ours is a constitutional right, uh, although that is the only definition that is different from your country, because I think the process of producing places to live for people is not also not successful. Uh, but I think that uh, it is incredible that in the whole world, mainly, mainly in the whole world, education and health are human uh, and constitutional rights but how can you learn if you don't have a place to live a healthy environment to live i mean it's been proved anywhere that uh the kids that don't have a safe environment at home cannot learn so i think we have to really base our focus on understanding how to really fulfill the core ne uh, necessities which is uh, health food and shelter in order to uh, produce the rest, no? I think that we have been experimenting with the possibility of uh, rethinking the house in many ways, and maybe uh, there are paths there. I don't think we've been critical enough, as I said before, but I think that we already have been since year exploring uh, the possibility and the notion of the domestic space. So what is a domestic space? We were um, invited to do this project, uh, which for me at the beginning was an experimental theoretical project in Germany near this lake in Ederse, Lake Ederse in Germany is in the southwest of the country. And, um, and what we said, the, the, the brief asked for a house that would hold the new ways of life. And for them, the new ways of life was working and living in the same space. Well. They were not Nostradamus predicting what, was, what is happening today. They actually were looking at uh, models of uh, domestic life that exist since centuries ago, but that they truly changed in the last 150 years with the industrial revolution, dividing work and live in, in different spaces. Um, so actually for me, it was not a new way of life. It was exploring the, the ways of life and uh, instead of being based our analysis and our programmatic definition into um, a, and compressing the, the spaces with programs like yeah a room with a living room and, uh, and a bathroom we wanted to open it to think that the spaces were defined by the activities we wanted to promote in them so we wanted to take out all the labels and think on spaces that would promote uh, activities with emotions. And we uh, uh, were able to decide that we wanted to really create six of these spaces in this house. Uh, we charted that first and we uh, collaged them, all these six spaces. I'm not gonna stop on why we collaged, but I think I'm, not, I'm only gonna say a line. Uh, we collaged because I think it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very inclusive 
process that opens imagination of the other in order to establish a more direct relationship towards the people who are going to inhabit it, but also towards the people who's designing the place. So in this case, we were only designing it because we don't, we didn't have a client. Although, as I said, I thought it was only a theoretic, theoretical project, but now it is a, a project. And um, uh, we're working with the clients. We're going to build this house in Germany. I cannot almost believe it because we really uh, like this house. Uh, because we wanted to explore, as I said, different possibilities of spaces that are based more on the definition of those spaces. So this space that I, we're seeing in the screen is clearly a space that will promote the, the relationship with the community and with their environment around, whether this space is a space that would, uh, we wanted to create to promote that possibility of self uh, inner reflection uh, or spaces that are able to be shared with a family or spaces that are really uh, for concentration and um, and study, or intimate spaces uh, for the construction of our own identity. So we collage them all all the six spaces. Then we uh, uh, put them all together. We create this uh, this beautiful drawing, uh, and then we from there we decided to create our idea for this place. Um, I still think that probably that the result is uh, the same result we would have arrived if we were if we would just decide that here there would be six, three rooms and a bathroom and a kitchen uh, but what i truly think is that uh, and I, and I, and we had already have already uh, proved it with the people that are interested that are going to build this house is that um, the possibility is open for many interpretations so what I find really interesting is that the, the family decided to choose almost one of the most intimate spaces as one, one we decided that it was for promoting this, the family relationship. And I think that this is the beauty of it because we each of us have a different understanding on how we live. We each of us have a different definition on how we exist. And not only that, we all have a different definition on how we live depending the moment of our um, life that we're living in. So it's not the same. I don't, I don't think the, the same way on what, how I want to live when I was 18 than when I'm now uh, today. No? So, and I think that um, uh, one of the, the channels that are opened by that is the possibility of including different types of configurations, but also opening the possibility of uh, really breaking that definition of a nuclear family. And I think that uh, the other question that then we are really into it is the understanding of the position of the architect. And this, I think we, we really truly did it when, um, when we uh, were part of the reconstruction of the earthquake. And um, uh, the, there was an earthquake in 2017, I don't know if you know, in Mexico City, 19 September 2017. The strangest thing that it was that it was exactly on the same day of one of the most devastating earthquakes that we had as a country. And uh, it was on the 19th of September of 1985. Uh, I was then 11 years old and I was really, um, uh, uh, moved and I already volunteered at that age uh, to, uh, I was not able to rebuild many things, but I was able to help with a lot of issues like food and, and, and clothes. And when this earthquake hit at Mexico, I decided to, among, uh, uh, along with other architects, to start a, uh, an organization called Reconstruir or reconstruction in English, uh, in order to really help people to rebuild their homes. We had the, the, the technical knowledge to do it, and we decided to go out in the country because one of the biggest problematics of this, this earthquake was that the damage was spread out in the territory uh, in, an, in a huge extension. 500,000 homes were down. The number of losses was not so high, it was only 300, well, only, 
it's horrible to say only 300 people. Um, and the reason was because most of these houses were uh, that uh, went uh, down were in small villages and around the country. So obviously the reconstruction became really challenging for the government, which also did not a very good job, I must say. And what we said is, well, why don't we uh, understand how to create a system or a strategy that we'd be able to help the majority amount of people that we can think of. So uh, we went out and started working in San Simon, which is um, a town near the, the city actually, where a thousand homes more or less were down. And where we, where we truly learn how is the, what is to have a position as an architect as part of the production of the, of the habitat of someone and not an impositive part of deciding how they should live. So we actually acted as, a, as one of the informers on how to build these houses, but we were not the designers. And the result is really beautiful. Everyone in the, were, was able to build their own house in their own way, but with some advice of us, but also other people to have a secure home that, uh, that really allow them, allows them to be sure that it's not going to get down again in the next earthquake, at least not a, a, a big part, no? I think then the, the, the second ring or layer uh, is to think on the common space. I think that right now in society, we're more and more ten, uh, leaning towards the idea that we have to live in this private cell uh, and then we have to have this incredibly uh, well-supported infrastructure network of public spaces. Uh, I think this is very problematic because there is a dichotomy on everything that we do. Or we live in the private realm or in the public realm, or we live in the private, um, in our own little room or in the, in the public park. Or uh, and our relationships are totally mediated with the others, except our own family. Or, and even with our own family in some cases, are mediated uh, with a huge institution that we don't even understand. And we're not part of it at all in complete. We are, but it's very abstract, no? So uh, the moment we open the gate of our, uh, of our house, or if you live uh, like me in an apartment and in a building, the moment you open the door, uh, the, what you are stepping on, it's mediated by a public institution that it's huge, that it's unknown and that it's totally impersonal. So uh, I think that those types of relationships then become productive relationships, economical relationships that are really uh, blocking the possibility of creating a social relationship. So I think that here is also a very important opportunity for architecture to be able to create those spaces of negotiation that become those spaces, those common spaces that are allowing uh, us to relate to the other to our immediate other uh, in a different way, no? So this is something you uh, also, Dolores Haydn has, speaking, has spoken a lot about it, but also we have been trying to think how to, you know, kind of un, uh, unravel the, the domestic uh, compound to create a compound instead of a, uh, of a nucleus, no? Instead of a, a, a space that encompasses everything. Um, and creating these potential spaces that could be uh, these negotiated scaled spaces towards the more collective areas, no? So in this case, we created a model for a house. Also, this is a house for a very low income uh, people that for us, the idea was to create those nucleus of intimate spaces uh, directly linked into a more uh, collect, uh, not collective, but a more shared space within the family. And those linked directly towards more common spaces within the, within the neighborhood or the block, you know? And they're creating uh, really uh, spaces that have this possibility of more state relationships. So uh, for example, you have your room and then the next, you open the door to your room and you have a space that is common with your family members that are normally is multi-generational that is possible to be shared with your aunt, your uh, grandma or, uh, or your neighbor. 
no and then you have another space that it's op uh, more open towards the neighbor and the more and more neighbors and then to the street so i really believe that um, by creating these stage relationships scaled stage relationships we can create really a healthier environment in, in terms of societal uh, experiences and um and i think also of that on the on the vertical realm even more importantly no so it's not um and i say even more importantly because i think in the rural realm is way easier to find those niches of uh more common uh, spaces that create uh in, personal relationships with the community because the space already exists for it than in the city no in the city for me uh the problem is uh, that actually right now the typology of the of the vertical um building doesn't allow at all that no for me the 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 um, the 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 high high rises are exactly uh, the same as suburbs they are completely alienated from the city life. And this is why we are trying to understand how we can create spaces in the vertical world because we need to become uh, vertical because otherwise how do we hold all this amount of people that need opportunities in the city, in the urban environments? And how can we be able to create structures that would open channels, first of all, of identification so right now in the buildings you don't have a, a, any possibility of being represented yourself you're just one number or one window uh, of thousands and um and not only that but also creating a more uh, organic experience that would allow you to relate to your neighbor to your fellow and not only by being uh for 20 seconds in the elevator without speaking to them no so how can we create a space that would also have the same uh, like it is an extension of the city no that is created organically with its own representation with its own possibilities with its own complexities and that creates these spaces of friction of negotiation that are what builds the relationships of others no so we created this idea of not another tower that was first presented in chicago and that has had many iterations because we have invited different people in every of the towers to to propose different um interventions but we also have taken it to towards the more real world we had this commission of doing a multi-use building and what we decided is that we wanted four totally different spaces that would be done by different people that would hold the different programs no so the commercial space that is linked to the street the interstitial space that it's uh kind of more art uh gallery space the office area which is also a different uh, world and the living space so we have been trying to experiment the understanding of those stages of relationships in many ways and i think the key moment where we um uh, understood that is uh in the current project that we're working on which is uh, a monastery in the in the uh, east east very east of germany uh it's a monastery for a cistercian order and um i have learned how really uh, instrumental their stage relationships towards the other is to their to their to their core uh ritual no so they uh their spirituality it's understood first in their body and the first representation of that spirituality is their robe the second one is and that constitutes them their identity is their cell then it's the the cloister and uh their internal relationships with the other monks and then is the relationships towards the whole community of the monastery then the next change of relationship even physically the space is designed like that if you think of it of a, of, a, of a typical monastery then uh, its relationship towards the community that the monastery is embedded in and i think this stage of relationships is also very uh, incredibly sustainable and logical in this uh, in this moment of the world i think if you think that we if we would be able to have these stages of relationship we wouldn't have had to shut completely our uh, uh, our and isolate completely ourselves towards just our intimate family no um 
one of the key uh, elements, as I said, as I've been saying, is the possibility of the, each individual to represent in itself. And we have also worked on that by allowing uh, our uh, strategy of house uh, being able to be built, however, but also to be being able to intervene, be intervened, uh, and to be able to represent anyone. No? From then, what happens with the possibility of the public space? I obviously understand that um, staging the relationships in a domestic space, this is a collage for a project we're doing in Monterrey of 164 apartments, that the idea is exactly to stage those relationships between three apartments, then there is a set of things that are relating 20, then there is a set of things that relate 40, then there is a set of things that relate the 164, and then how this relates to the community and the exterior is also a very important step. Um, we have been working uh, in the public realm in many ways, and one of the uh, uh, most uh, important projects for the office has been the Botanical Garden in Culiacán, where um, uh, uh, the representation of the collective becomes the important part. But when we have those relationships staged, this possibility becomes exponential. No? So then the importance of the public space, uh, which I was referring before, is not that it's not of the utmost importance, is that it needs really all these stages to become then really what a space of representation, a public space for representation for all, then will be. No? So I think that um, uh, what we have really understood in this botanical garden is, first of all, that you as architect don't need to impose, impose a system of relationships just enhance the possibility of what it already exists on the garden. Like for example, uh, we introduced these chairs to a space that existed already, that probably when we arrived, and not probably, when I arrived there 15 years ago in my old controller of the universe mind, uh, arch tra architect trained mind, um, um, so uh, really the problems of it, you know, of a space that was done very intuitively, that was not planned, that was not designed. Oh my God, that corner is really horrible. Horrible for who? I mean, who am I to decide what is horrible and what not in a public space? I mean, this is one of the most uh, incredible uh, revelations that I have had uh, since this project, you know, is like who, what you are to think that for this garden where people are really uh, doing all kinds of exercise, the best thing would be to do a yoga hut, no? So at some point I, dis I said that because people are doing yoga, Pilates, eh, eh, Tai Chi, etc. for the, um, in the garden at any hour, at any hour of the day, self-organized. And I decided that it was really interesting and would be the best space if we would, would we would do a yoga um, a hut there, no? With I thought this would this is going to be the most beautiful hut in the world, yoga place that you can ever be, etc. And immediately, like kind of the people in the garden were looking at me with these big faces, is like, are you nuts? And I was like, come on, there's a thousand people every day that do yoga in this place. And they're like me saying that, I already realized, okay, and then how a thousand people are gonna share this space? Uh, they're gonna, there's, need, uh, there's gonna be a, 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 a shuttle needed. The oops, uh, oh, okay, a, a shuttle, then, then you need to, to sign in in advance. Oops, uh, sign in in advance and a teacher and the payment, oof. And I already started to understand how uh, really all our, th that really would institutionalize exactly what uh, you don't want to institutionalize that because everything is already institutionalized. And here it was happening naturally, intuitively. So what we decided to do is just to promote all the things that were happening in the garden and not to impose an order that we could think it's right, but it would actually kill 
completely what the activities that were happening there. And uh, for example, is we did very simple things that were also enhancing the nature as exposing the irrigation system instead of hiding it. It's a very natural one. It's not technified. It's done by gravity actually. But we decided to expose it and actually not only the, the people benefited from knowing how it was done, uh, because it, they, it, then it, they became responsible for it. it. It also became very good for the, for the environment because it became more human. So the ecosystems really improved. Uh, and there was uh, already an art, uh, a possibility of introducing an art collection in the, in the garden that was also uh, doing exactly the same, you know, opening channels for the everyday life of these people instead of imposing a way of you viewing or seeing art or enjoying art. No? So we have pieces of the most important artists in the world. This is Adrián Villarrojas. This is Dan Graham that I really use in an everyday way. And this is why and how the community of Culiacán who had never had uh, contact with art before is in starting to uh, not only relate to art, but being part of the discussion that uh, art necessarily brings to it no for example these couple um were questioning these uh this piece of art by francis Salis is one of the most renowned artists in the world and he crashed this uh, bocho there and uh this couple were saying oh my god how a drunk guy was able to enter to our garden and crash his his bocho no uh but uh, i was there i took this photo so i know <laughs> i i heard the dialogue uh, but immediately after then they understood this is a piece of work of someone giving death to his uh, bocho in this natural environment and how that contrast and then they became part of the discussion of of this piece and uh, therefore what uh, what uh, art is for or this richard long piece that uh, a similar one is installed in, uh, in is was installed in new york in seagram uh, plaza and um, that there is obviously untouched with its uh, label without being, um, you know, like violated or anything. Oh, that's what we think. But here it became the, the setting for picnics, the, of runways, of fashion shows, uh, of Instagram videos, or the, even the house of a lizard. Uh, and there's no issues. The piece is really beautiful, even more with all these things happening on it. Our architecture tried to do that and try to open channels of communication, of really reminding people that you were in a botanical garden, of de uh, fragmenting the program uh, or the or the buildings in the most uh, possible way, to uh, really uh, you know if you are in this place which is a lecture hall and have to go to the bathroom, well you have to go out and go to the bathroom which is this other volume. If it's raining, well you get wet. But guess what? You're in a botanical garden. I think that also one of the problems is that we have really uh, creating a system of, uh, of comfort that goes beyond uh, uh, any, uh, any analysis, you know? It's like it's not necessary, even though this place gets to 50 degrees centigrade, which I don't know, it's many, many degrees Fahrenheit, more than 100. Um, uh, 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 and uh, of a system of comfort that you are now used to be in the air conditioning spaces always and uh, in totally alienation with your surrounding and we're becoming human beings that are less adaptive to the to the to the situation and we are destroying the environment in, in the in the meanwhile no so what is the problem that if you are in a botanical garden okay i'm not saying you have to live with 50 degrees centigrade your whole life but if you're in a botanical garden for an event why don't you enjoy the possibilities of the nature that it's allowing you to to that it's uh, giving you the possibility in this in this city um, that you don't normally have. No, why not? I mean, why you wanna be as comfortable as you are in the shopping mall in uh, the botanical garden? Well, no, guess not. This is a botanical garden, so we wanted our architecture to always remind you that, and the, we design our buildings to uh, expel you from the buildings every time you have to change activity, every time you have to go to do different things, but also allow you to explore then different parts of the garden that otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't do. No? So, um, and I think that uh, we have been working, as I said, in this uh, project for 15 years. And um, 
I'm not going to extend and explain why we did the buildings and how it's been evolved, but I think it, is, it has been an incredible opportunity of understanding how to act as an architect uh, in order to enhance a space and not to impose an order that would just kill what already exists and what the society constructs. No? Um, I'm just going to show you uh, a last project very quickly. Um, and I think because all of this uh, then ends up of being, you know, our collective uh, space that it's being built, it's also necessary to discuss how are we building our collective memory and how are we posing ourselves through history because that is one of the things that architecture does. And um, I'm going to finish this with uh, an incredibly ironic project and um, probably the one that really <laughs> uh, questions much more what I do, which is an aquarium. Because for me, the aquariums are those programs that are exactly what I said before, those programs that are mind controller of the universe. I, I love this uh, painting by Diego Rivera uh, that he did for Rockefeller. Rockefeller didn't want it, that painting, so he destroyed it. And then it's been reproduced, but it's, it never existed as a, as a, as a mural. Um, and uh, why? Because uh, there, it's a world where we cannot access uh, normally, naturally. Only very few people are able to access that world, the, the subaquatic world. And we, since we are not able to, um, to, um, to access it, then we bring it to us in the way of an aquarium. So finally, I'm not going to also go to the whole story because I need another three hours to, to say the whole story. But I was able to connect with a client, which we had been working because we were designing already since five years ago this uh, park uh, that we knew that in two corners, one, it would have a, a museum and in the other one would have um, an aquarium designed by other people and uh, we were designing the park. The park that con constitutes a natural transition between a flooded space and a, uh, and a more dry space when the, in, in the middle lagoon is um, growing and shrinking because of the seasons, the rainy and the dry season. And how could we take advantage of that to create an, eco an ecosystem that would allow people to be interacting with it in the middle of this uh, uh, beach city, which is called Mazatlan. So when we were doing that, they were asking us for to do the aquarium. And uh, the good thing is that one of the questions that they had for the aquarium was, uh, for introducing this program, was uh, the, the, um, the fact that they really didn't uh, uh, really coincide co with the idea of creating an aquarium that would have whales and uh, turtles and penguins uh, in, in this place, no? So I said, well, you have the most, uh, you are uh, situated in the door of one of the most important ecosystems of, in the world, which is the Sea of Cortez. Why are you going to look at penguins and uh, species that doesn't belong here instead of looking towards your window and protecting the space where you live in? So uh, we decided to intervene in this place and to create a, 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 a building that we don't know what it was used for. Um, in, in 2020, it was built and we don't know what it was used. And then in 2100, it was flooded. And when the water receded, finally, at some point, uh, the life was able to uh, survive in this place, was able to, ex uh, to, to continue living. And uh, only we arrived to open niches in this, and paths in this place to allow people to visit it. No? So um, this is the idea behind the aquarium. We wanted a, a place that would be a, a built-in or a constructed ruin that would be invaded by nature. And uh, that the architecture would promote that invasion of nature. And in this way, 
we are broadening the definition and, uh, of the dichotomy that exists between man and nature, uh, man controller of the universe, which is absolutely crazy that we can think we can control the universe because the universe controls us. We are part of it and we have to change the hierarchical relationship. And we thought this building could start opening channels to people think that, no? to people understand that. This building is under construction uh, right now is in a beautiful state of ruin, <laughs> which I really hope it would stay, and that nature invades it, and that then one day uh, it opens its doors and then it becomes a place where really we could understand how really nature dominates us and not and not that us dominate this. So this is why at this moment on all uh, what I've said, I take protest uh, and I take protest of uh, promising that I will work the, uh, in the rest of my professional career in order to understand how we could from the profession that we do, uh, do something that is um, completely the opposite of the definition of what the profession is, which is a colonizing, discriminating um, pro profession that thinks that we can design something that anyone else could become, um, could use for representation. And with this, I will end up my, um, my talk. Uh, well, and I will be open for questions if there's still time. I'm sorry I took a lot of your time. Um, I will disconnect my phone and I will go back to the Zoom in, in the screen so I can listen to you better. Okay, you, you may have to go back and forth, Tatiana, because your, your voice, the sound was absolutely perfect. You know what, I actually, since we have in the Zoom and we're not in the call, I can completely he listen to you, so I can, I can continue with this. Okay. All right, so let, let's talk a little bit about the format before you and I enter into a, a conversation. Uh, and I should preface by saying, what, wow, such a poignant, powerful, and timely lecture. <laughs> Thank uh, you. And, and uh, wonderfully unexpected. In other words, um, you, I'm sure you could have given many different types of lectures and it was implied by your, your opening uh, statement that something had taken place, uh, not only in Mexico, but around the world uh, that required um, a serious response. But let me just say before we, I, I wanna uh, talk more uh, to the students. And, and typically there's a, uh, the format has been that, that I will, uh, uh, raise a series of questions or, or observations about the things that you shared with us. And then at some point we'll transition uh, over to the students or even the faculty asking questions. And I, I urge any of them to start thinking about what they want to ask you uh, because that's really important. And they, and they should not be timid or shy. Uh, you certainly are not. You're brave and courageous and uh, you're challenging all of us uh, to think outside the box and, and, and be uh, conscious uh, of what is often defined as unconscious bias, that, that there are certain codes of behavior and, and certain institutional norms uh, that we've, had, we've accepted uh, uh, individually and collectively from one generation to the next. And it's often very difficult to step back objectively and say, hey, whoa, that's, that's really uh, problematic and flawed. And as you said, it perpetuates inequality and racism and, and, and uh, gender and ethnic bias. But I, I, I probably start off by saying, um, one, one of the things that, uh, was, uh, there's obviously the content in the lecture, but, but I have to say that uh, if I had to describe uh, the way in which you've communicated your uh, priorities and interests and aspirations, it was a public confession. Mm -hmm. and, and we rarely, we rarely see that, especially in the US where there's so much um, uh, corruption and propaganda <laughs> more than ever in my lifetime. And the airwaves uh, in every direction uh, are 
somehow compromised with a lack of truth and honesty and sincerity. It was so, so refreshing to hear you simply say, hey, look, you know, I, and you've been practicing for many decades. And, and that other lecture you could have given and you might have given five, 10 years ago would have been a tour de force in its own right because you would have shown uh, a whole range of built projects and you might have gone further into the, the syntax of architecture in, in terms of the materiality of architecture, uh, the experiential nature of architecture, a whole range of inter, uh, areas of, of uh, interest for you that still manifest but you chose not to foreground it tonight, but rather um, highlight an existential threat uh, to uh, our kind of uh, global family. And, and I just want to start off by uh, thanking you uh, because it, um, uh, it is really profound and it is so timely. I mean, uh, as, as, a, as a dean of a school, uh, the, the the whole question of inequity and and racial justice uh, and uh, gender inequality and certainly black the Black Lives Matter movement, which is you know is in is an incredible phenomenon where uh, millions of people uh, have risen up in the U.S. and and around the world to speak out uh, in protest of this, and um, it's just. It's very difficult, I, I think, for architects to see themselves as activists, uh, to be political, not in a partisan way, but conscious of the fact that they hold power, even if there are limitations of that power. And on that note, I wanted to, um, to just highlight for the audience that you, your practice expands into a multiplicity of arenas where you have had impact. One is uh, as um, an educator through your teaching. Uh, certainly an outgrowth of that is, is giving public lectures like you have. Uh, another one is in your advisory role with governmental agencies. Another one is uh, the community service that you spoke about with respect to the reconstruction organization. And then finally through the discipline of architecture and that and that even though, depending on the scale of the building, uh, it, could, it could start from the bottom up where it reaches a, a small number of people, but maybe it represents uh, a new paradigm in a variety of ways uh, as a designer that could uh, proliferate either by you or by uh, uh, your fellow colleague designers. So, uh, in no kind of particular order, one of the key uh, phrases that you use was creating a system of care. And it seems to me it's a kind of a, a theoretical, but a, a kind of pragmatic uh, scaffold within which many of the things that you spoke about today reside. And even the, the use of the term care is so beautiful because it, it it's about a certain generosity. It's about giving back. Um. Yeah, thank you, Eman. I think it's been, um, as I said, it's been a challenging period in my life because it challenges everything, no? And it makes you very uncomfortable uh, on where you're standing and what you have done and what you have said, as, I, as you said, correctly i have done many lectures where i praise my projects and kind of say oh how nice they are and how well uh, they're settled in the any community or how uh, they are creating incredible things and probably some of them are in their opening things but uh, they're not exactly where i think they should be because um uh, really as uh, uh, i think that they are all uh, starting from the fact that we live in this system of uh, in uh, that it only can allow productive and economical relationships and way less in a in a system where it can produce social relationships no and as you say I think that we don't only have um, 
and the possibility of doing things by ourselves, we have the power of that, but we have forgotten because since we have created these huge institutions, no, starting from the government that uh, direct our things and regulate all what we do, and they are so big and abstract that we really don't uh, um, uh, be are able to 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 hold an accountant of it, then um, in, in rather beyond than voting and protesting you know, at some point, you feel frustrated and then you say, no, it's impossible, I cannot do the change. But if we all think, uh, um, uh, you know, really like uh, that we can do and if we really act in our own way with our own things like that, and we will do it, we will transform the world. No, that is the power that we have. So I think that, um, and the other thing is what I was saying, that if we don't, if we are not able to think in those stages of scales, then you, then it becomes impossible because if you only think yourself be, uh, versus the institution, well, then it's impossible, or yourself versus nature, no? Sometimes also with nature is the same. We think that by saving uh, bags when we go to the supermarket, we're not going to do anything for the environment. Well, guess what? If we don't consume uh, bags, all of us, then we're going to save the environment, no? So it really um, is the same, but you, since it's so big, that relationship, you are not able to to grasp it it's because also there is a, a you know an integral complexity within ourselves uh, because who we are um, that we are not able to de decipher those uh, complexities at all you know and this is why we sometimes relegate ourselves from it so i think that we have to take position and we have uh, to to think that uh, each of us could do within our own life and uh, possibilities, uh, create a very big impact, no? And I think that it, there is also not anything else that I could speak of at this moment. I don't feel comfortable by again, sitting here and doing a lecture on how beautiful is my work. I, I really can't, I'm not, I, I'm not there, but also I don't think it's the moment <laughs> for listening to anyone saying that, no? Yeah, but I, I also, you're being enorm, uh, enormously uh, 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 modest. Uh, or in other words, it, it seems to me that you're operating uh, simultaneously on a variety of scales and according to different uh, agencies. And, and each of them requires a, a different uh, mode of engagement. So, so for example, uh, the project that uh, you work with your colleagues after the earthquake, it, it was clear to you, or certainly implied by how you described it, that you had to decentralize the role of the author and empower the, the occupant, homeowner, a, as a designer in, in the participatory process, which was quite beautiful. On the other hand, in juxtaposition, you, you have another project where you're reassessing the contemporary kitchen and, and you have to use uh, your skill sets and your knowledge as a, a very experienced and savvy architect over many years in recognition that there's a modular system and that it was through the, the modules of those cubes on wheels that you could create, in theory, infinite diversity and flexibility. So, in other words, it's almost um, uh, working between uh, a kind of Western conception of surgery and an Eastern idea of acupuncture. There are light touches and there are more invasive moves that require that your authorship kind of state a claim, however sensitive and thoughtful it might be. And I, I raise that because it's really important that the, the students understand that, that in the process of, of, of having more of an activist mind and working in in collaborations, it doesn't mean that their, their creative vision and their particular sensibility and experience as architects doesn't hold an enormously important role in this process. 
Well, I, I think that uh, probably is more about experimenting. <laughs> I've been experimenting what works better of the Western surgery syst medical system or the acupuncture of the East um, uh, than anything else. No, I must say that I've been also testing. And obviously, I don't think that this comes new. No, this, this moment in my life, it doesn't, it doesn't come as new. No, it's something that I've been questioning my whole life. But I think that I was not seriously dramatically questioning it from its core until now but probably I wouldn't be able to arrive to that point um, I think someone has it, their phone open there. hey Robert I think we have to cut off the mics so that we can hear Tatiana um, I think that uh, so as I said I don't think it comes out of nowhere I think I've been testing through all uh, the, my career, all of those things, no? But on the other hand, I also believe that uh, all those uh, things need to be done in the smallest uh, possible intervention to the biggest possible that you can do, no? I don't think that you should do change strategies. I think that the same values are important, are important universally no so i think that this is why i am also uh, doing that in those senses and i uh, one of the core things i believe to in our practice you know try to uh, change the way we act and we operate is by that by understanding that we cannot be so arrogant to think that we can be the authors of someone else's lives you know and so how can we become those tools for anyone else to decide how is to do their own life and how is their own space and build and construct the public, the private and the, and the common and whatever, you know? So I think that is, um, is a responsible act uh, uh, within the, the practice. And I think that this is something that we have to teach from the core, no? And um, yeah, definitely it, there are societies that accept this better than others and places that are more easier to implement within the same system that we're living in, no? But I think that it's, it is possible to be implemented. I'm, uh, um, and I'm trying that. And this is at least what I said, that I'm taking progress to try that and take it to wherever the consequences need to be taken, no? It's, it's, it's incredibly impressive. You know, I'm, um, I'm reminded uh, of when we, we, we speak about norms and, and biases and, and, and uh, systems of control uh, about a world, historically we live in a world that has devised these uh, taxonomic systems. Uh, if we take the, the aquarium, for instance, that, that all living creatures are put into these these boxes, these taxonomic boxes, and 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 you know, as as time goes on, they they uh, they find some kind of weird, strange, exotic uh, organism, and they can't figure out uh, how it fits into a system that has, in in theory, worked for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, and it completely uh, undermines a, a kind of belief system, and and I'm using that as an analogy to the, uh, to the fact that, that um, architecture, there, there are certain universal conventions, of course, mm, we have to be very uh, careful because in different uh, territories around the planet, those conventions and the meaning assigned to both objects and spaces and rituals change. And that's something that you, you shared with us tonight, but something as prosaic and mundane and seemingly innocent as the bathroom, uh, as the kitchen, as the sleeping quarters uh, are, in, are kind of, let's just say it, uh, governed by a series of accepted codes. And your thesis proposes that we have to unpack that and kind of reinvest in both the kind of conceptual and and cultural assignment of meaning uh, in those terrains, which is which is really beautiful. And I would argue that that one of the things 
uh, and I'm talking about certain conceptual and design practices that you seem to be deploying, one of, it, one of them is a kind of purposeful ambiguity that no space would ever be just a bathroom and just a kitchen and just a bedroom. In fact, there would be an explicit attempt for a multiplicity of uses or the flexibility of transformation. And then something else that appears to be uh, very present in your work, not only in terms of the spaces, the architecture, uh, architectural destinations, but uh, certain ways in which you actually come up with ideas, making representational systems, games of chance. The, the, the house in Germany used a collage technique. And, I, and my sense was, because you were moving through that project very quickly, my sense was that you had created a game, a kind of board game, and that you could have created an infinite set of houses as outcomes. I mean, one of them stopped like a kind of Duchampian, you know, <laughs> uh, system. And you said that one will be the house. But anyway, if you could talk about uh, the games of chance and purposeful ambiguity. Yes, I think that uh, one of the important aspects, and I didn't uh, speak about that project because uh, it was going to become too long. It's, um, we, I, we did a project, I'm trying to look for the image, and, and I, uh, we did a project in, um, in Spain where we decided that it was um, really important this it was even before the house in Germany. It was really important to forget the labels of the spaces to start with, no? Because the what uh, what we're also doing uh, uh, in, uh, as architects is we are imposing a way of using a space uh, that not necessarily below, uh, really represents everyone, no? So and also really. Um, uh, is the like encapsules life and generalizes life in a way homogenizes life in a way that it's not giving us any good results and I think we have uh, proved that no in modernism the search was for uh, equality and democracy and we translated that into archit into generic architecture yeah Per, call, call it functional, uh, where, you know, like the bathroom, the kitchen, the room, everything white and open, and you can do whatever there. Well, guess what? You are not uh, able to identify with that space, and you impose uh, a way of living that probably don't suit you, no? There, um, there's people that really don't need a kitchen. I mean, how many of you in this audience cook, really, like intensively cook? Very few, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm not saying, but that there's nothing wrong with it, but why in the world do you need a kitchen? I mean, you probably don't. Um, who do you really think that need um, a, a living space? Why not uh, a sleeping with a garden? I mean, you know, it, there are many ways. So first of all, we thought, you, why don't you take out the labels? In this project, what we did is we created a very specific identity of aesthetic that is very determined, it's not generic, it's not white and pure, it's not the white box, it really has a strong personality, but it's not labeled. So any space can be used on whatever way you want, you know, and whatever in the way you really want to understand it is good for you. Or you can use one or two of these modules to become your whole household, or you will extend your household in the whole mod, uh, whole in, um, um, compound, or uh, it's many families and using it one or two or three or depending what uh, in modules. And um, well, this hasn't been built, but our idea was even hard to represent because um, we needed to submit plans <laughs> for the municipality and they were asking us to label us and we were like saying well that already determines uh, something that it's probably not what we want and we don't want anyone to find these uh, plans so we created these plan sections models in one that are ambiguously enough uh, that are fulfilling the code demands so we can really be part of the system what i was saying which is also important because otherwise we cannot really make change. And 
uh, but still leave our design as open as possible. No? So I think, uh, well, I already answered your question, uh, your two questions in one, but I think that one of the most important things is that we stop labeling things the way we think they should be, um, they, they, they should be because we're determining already someone else's lives and we're impossibilitating, uh, the, we're, we're closing the possibility of the other one to interpretation. No? And I think that's why we also use these types of representations because to allow more uh, minds to uh, to interpret them in different ways. No, great answer, uh, great answer, and I, and I and I love the image. It's it's almost like a game of chance right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pivot into a couple of uh, related but different directions. Um, what advice would you give? Uh, the women in our school, the young emerging female architects who were, you know, uh, 18 to 21 that are uh, entering into the profession. Um, and, you know, it seems to me that the, that the world is a wake up call, but certainly your, your, your lecture uh, points to a higher degree of specificity and experience that you've encountered. You, you start off the lecture, I think, uh, sharing with us the fact that there was a protest by women in Mexico uh, and I imagine it was met like many protests around the world with opposition. What, what kind of um, discrimination and uh, resistance have you had to overcome and, 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 and how would you mentor? And I suppose it, while it may be specific in this particular question, to young women, I, I'm, I'm sure there's advice that you can give to young men as well. Well, first of all, to everyone is that I think that we cannot um, uh, let ourselves to be comfortable at any time in your life, anywhere. Question everything that you do and these ways, the way you're gonna advance and make something else, you know? And I think that uh, that is a, a very big thing for all, but for, for um, responding more to your question in women first of all i have to say that this question still today makes me very uncomfortable to answer because i feel that if i answer something related to women's or women's only um, i'm discriminating myself already as if we were different um, one of the things that i was very um angry with in the beginning of my career was all those questions no so the first question of the audience would always be like what is the difference for you being a woman and um and i was already angry because they, that was not the first question that they were asking to my friends colleagues men no uh, second question that they always ask is do you have children it's like why do they never ask that question to a man i mean it's like <laughs> no <laughs> uh, children are raised by men and women at equal or should be at least um but i understood through the years and specifically key because of one of my friends men architect uh, that uh, one day sat next to me and said, Tatiana, I totally agree with your point. I I'm, cannot be more um, really, um, uh, I cannot agree more with you in the fact that you are angry when they ask you this question, but tell me something. Who, uh, what women did you hear lecturing when you were uh, studying architecture? And I was like, mm, Lina Bobardi. And she said, no, don't, don't tell me that's not true. Who you really heard in an auditorium in front of you lecturing that you were really looking to up to and i was like uh, okay no one well then it's different so you have to really 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 make um a, make yourself conscious of the existence of the big problem and that is to say that i had never had an issue uh, a really big issue no different than my other colleagues of discrimination in my life i only have had real incredible opportunities because I, I am a woman. And that is horrible because we shouldn't, because we should have equal opportunities. 
And I right now I'm living in a, in a, I arrived at the same, at the correct place in the correct moment because they're always looking for gender balance, no? So we have an exhibition, uh, but we have five men architects where we need women, Tatiana. And we have a competition, uh, but there are only five women that we, five, five male practices that we're inviting. We need women, Tatiana. Uh, we need, so they need to balance gender. So they invite me and this way you get, uh, experience you get exposed it is not nice but I have understood that I have to really uh, take that role uh, in order to really open channels to make it more equal in the future no so I would say that there is a very big um, um, kind of misunderstanding that for all for us the privileged people that are able to have a higher education, we're already privileged with that because that is really uh, the lo low percentage in the world that are able to access to a higher education. Uh, we already in, in the place where we are have way more opportunities than the women in the whole world, than the majority of the women in the whole world. So if you're already here, you already have a very important chance of having exactly the same opportunities or even more opportunities than your male colleagues have. Even and more interestingly, I was talking um, uh, in, to a very long time friend which, who, who operates in a totally different way in an older generation, which is Jack Herzog. And he told me, no, Tatiana, this is your moment. It's women's, it's women's world. There's no chance for me anymore, you know, white European male forget, I'm done, you know, now is the, the, the moment for women. So, but it's true, it is true. So please, I think that one of the most important things is that uh, women have to take power and understand that we have the same power as men, you know, uh, but you, we just haven't realized that. And so we have to just fight for it in order to open the channels for further generations to not have to deal with it. No, I, I, because it's not nice. <laughs> no, no, Tatiana, I, I appreciate your, your candid answer. Maybe I should have prefaced, you know, um, being black in the United States uh, is a unique experience. And, and I would be the first to say that I don't know exactly what that is. And... Um, you know, I remember having a, a, a conversation with an extremely accomplished African American educator, a president of a college, and and currently on on a few board of trustees. I mean, this is a uh, a, a, a beautiful man who uh, has dedicated his life. Uh, to empowering others and to educating the, the next generation of, of architects, artists, and engineers. And, and he would share with me the fact that he can still, he still drives his car and down the street and, and policemen will stop him and frisk him and, and assume uh, that uh, something is wrong and that and that he's, he's, he's violated uh, some kind of accepted rule and, and his, his life is in danger. Now, you know, this is hopefully the, uh, the, the current conversation that's happening in our country will allow us to, to kind of um, cross over and try to understand perspectives we otherwise we would have no opportunity to know about and and the amount of fear and the kind of existential threat to one's life and i maybe i'm using this as a an extreme example but example um the the conversations that we have to enter into can be awkward and they can be uncomfortable and 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 maybe they they expose a certain naivete and a certain cultural bias that all of us uh, carry with us. Um, but it's not about uh, reaffirming walls and, and places of division. 
it's it's about op opening up a certain kind of uh, honesty and and kind of shared knowledge and experience that I think is really important. So while we're talking about uh, mentors, uh, in some of your writings, you actually uh, mentioned two people that I thought you didn't discuss it in your presentation today, but I thought it'd be interesting to hear more about how they've influenced you. Uh, Baragon, and someone I know less about, Mario uh, uh, Honey, the, uh, the great legendary uh, Mexican architect and urbanist. Um, can you share with us uh, how these two individuals have inspired you? Can you hear me now? Because I could begin yeah. my own. Great. Um, so I, um, eh, but, um, eh, I read that I be uh, more influenced by Mario Pani, by Barragan, eh, and my beauty, the way, uh, the sensibility of Barragan. I think the uh, Barragan type of architecture that uh, it, it has. Uh, uh, a true uh, spiritual way of living that I don't and I this I admire so much and this is what I wish I had because I think now in Namona I, I I his <laughs> spiritual and a more rational and a more rational way of looking first Pani had more of that no and uh, actually live Mario Pani and um, and I know his actually very well, very well. Uh, and uh, but I think one of the uh, key things is Mario Pane, politician. Uh, my, to say, not a, he really is, um, uh, understood the question as uh, uh, as politician, you know. So he doing politics within structure. I'm much more inclined to that way of operating because I probably that my 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 come from. I have it in my that's what my used to say. And um and so Mario Pani has been very much in I really think that he will be um critical on the production of place on the production collective and and he has created an impact that I do, uh, both uh, on what I would like to uh, to go to, to, where I would not like, because on the other hand, he was doing uh, inspiration in terms of um, uh, uh, different uh, back that made many, many big part of the Um, Tatiana, I'm going to pause your video to see if that uh, helps our bandwidth a little bit. Oh, not here. I don't know. Call them. Cannot hear. Ed. Can you hear? Yes, we can, but there's a bit of a ah. dis distortion. Uh, keep. I can hear. Okay, let, we'll we'll just let, we'll try it this way. I I don't know if we we heard everything that you said. Um, what advice, Tatiana, would you give to to the next generation of architects about? seeking out mentors and and in recognition that being around interesting brilliant inspiring people at an early age can can have a lifelong impact mm -hmm. oh hear me, hear me. Hear me. yeah there's an echo though echo though hey robert Mm 
now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, it's because I, I think Robert, Robert can the microphone connection. Yeah, there's something still wrong, yeah. But you can try speaking now. Tatiana, can you hear us? Hello. <laughs> well, technology. Uh, Robert, we need your help on this one. You be able to open my in the other con I have. Yeah, I have a second question. Okay. And I need to open there. Right, currently there's there's an echo still. Yeah. You know, while we're trying to fix that, I I, I hope you don't try now. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm ready. I I'm here. Oh, Can that's you hear great. me now? Yeah. Yes. The students Thank should you. start thinking about questions for our guest speaker. So Tatiana, did you hear my my question to you before? Which one? Oh, the one about mentors and um uh, obviously, one one can be inspired by by those that have uh, lived before us, and that's really critical. But also, their living mentors. And what advice would you give the next generation of architects in in the context of seeking out uh, individuals, actually in any profession discipline, that can inspire them and provide you know invaluable knowledge and insight. You know what? Who uh, and I, I've said this ever, every person that, has, uh, that I have had contact with inspires me in a way. Mm -hmm. And if you allow yourself to open your eyes to that, to that, to think that anyone can inspire you, I think we are already opening channels of communication with others that we normally don't have. And, um, and I, I, I truly say it, no? for me, it's um, the same I admire uh, someone who has achieved incredible things that uh, my the, the guy that works in the garden in my building there's in there's reasons in every person that you would admire and just try to look at them and then you understand many ways of uh, of thinking and living and then you can be more um, in acceptance no one of the uh, the the things that um, I was in in the U.S. in I was in New York actually the 9th of November of 2016 that <laughs> representative day that changed the the the, the way of pol that politics had been done in your country. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for me was exposing that they they really exist in the world um, half of the world thinks the opposite of me. For me, it was a day that exposed in my face the fact that there was uh, really a lot of people that not only think differently than me, think the opposite than me, and think, think uh, of something that I think it's impossible to think. No? And for me, it was a sad day because um, part of the campaign of this president based on the discrimination of my country. And for me, that's very difficult uh, to say. And so this is why I, uh, for me, I remember that day very clearly. But for me, it was very uh, surprising that there was able to, uh, that a half of the population was able to vote and to think what he thinks of us as Mexicans, you know? So um, for me, it was an eye opener to think that there is a huge amount of people that think exactly the opposite. How are we going to really uh, be able to create a society if we don't see them, you know, if we don't include them in our lives and we don't dialogue with them? Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, that starting with admiring someone that even uh, thinks the opposite of you would be uh, a step forward. Well, I, I certainly uh, apologize on behalf of uh, the United States. <laughs> you uh, don't I, have to. No, it's, it, it, <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> it's that you, person. I can tell you that 
that uh, it's been very destructive and and uh, uh, it, mor morally unsound. And our brothers and sisters in the South, throughout Latin America, are are um, an incredibly interesting and exceptional culture that we have a lot to learn from. I'm I'm curious. You, you you're a practitioner um a kind of community organizer uh and and you worked in government um but you also teach I, i'm curious uh your views on how schools might be reconceptualized in the 21st century in in, in the context of, of what you shared with us today, curriculum. Uh, well, I, as I said, I think we have to, um, for, to say I would, I would really like to see the system completely change, you know, because mm -hmm. I, first of all, teach because I learn more there than anywhere else. So I really teach for a selfish, um, completely selfish reason, which is learning. And, uh, and I think that if we based the syst our system in learning from each other and not a, a hierarchical, hierarchical system of uh, the teacher and the, and the student, even the little ones, I learn from my girls every day uh -huh. things that I otherwise I would not learn, you know, for sure. So I believe I'm, uh, my mom is a teacher of a, kinder, a kindergarten teacher or was a kindergarten teacher through all her life. And she really said that that is how she built her herself, you know, by learning from these kids. So you, uh, if we try to understand that, uh, that we can uh, create a system of learning from each other instead of from the other, we would uh, really be able to build a different um, society. But I think that in the meantime that that doesn't happen, we can start within the system that exists and to do that within the same system, no? So I always uh, um, treat my studios as uh, experiments where I'm putting myself in, in places where I don't know, uh, where I don't really um, uh, uh, have the knowledge of and to experiment and explore and learn from each other no so our already our studios are these um shared collective uh shared knowledge collective spaces that hopefully allow us all of us to uh question uh, the things and how we do them you know so i think that uh, uh, we should all start treating that way in a school maybe if it's possible. <laughs> no, thank you for that. I mean, I um, certainly we could always do a better job speaking for our own school, but uh, from the moment I arrived, it, it seemed to me that, that, that one wants to break the, the kind of artificial boundaries between academia and the community at large. And, and to the extent that, that there can be a, a collaborative conversation that takes place uh, throughout uh, the time that the student passes through the school, so they're conscious of the fact that they're different perspectives, and that sometimes architecture is a a private and and hermetic language. We're very good at talking to ourselves. And, Completely and I, agree. <laughs> yeah, I think what you've done is you've been explicitly uh, forward and proactive about breaking those boundaries down and, and trying to think of architecture as a universal language, right? You, you, a number of the projects, thinking of the botanical garden tonight, where it sounded like maybe under a normal situation, an architect might have a heavy hand and it would be like a writer completing the sentences and the, and the, and the chapters in a book, but you purposely would leave something incomplete precisely in anticipation that the occupants, the visitors, needed space to to, to kind of author the work. And I, I, I find that not only generous, but and, and, and beautifully um, 
kind of benevolent, but I also think it's very sophisticated. You know, it, like, like you understand when to stop designing and, and, and what kinds of things and systems and devices can be put into the built environment that, that activate social engagement. They're not things, they're, they're like verbs. Well, I don't always know, but I try. <laughs> and I not always do it correctly, but at least I try. And that is the other thing I would say to everybody here is like, you should never stop trying, you know? That is the way you can learn and you can test. And sometimes there are incredible um, turnouts. Let, let me bring something else up. And it, it, we live in a world uh, today where the, the profession uh, relies so heavily on technology and more specifically it's all it's fetishized in in many ways i mean it can it certainly has an extraordinary role to play in terms of improving the lives of people uh, but it, it all also offers a kind of abundance of seduction and i'm now talking about the representational systems in architecture if i understand correctly you you've taken an, ex an explicit stance where you choose not, and tell me if I'm wrong, you've chosen not to present your work using renderings, that you would prefer, prefer to make these draw drawings manually. And, and uh, I, I suppose there's, there's a, a kind of sense of the hand and the time and the effort and the craft in, embedded uh, in, in that work. Can you, can you speak to that issue a bit? Yeah, absolutely. I believe that architecture, uh, especially when it's being done, but throughout, even when it's built, it needs to be able to uh, create uh, or, you know, um, en uh, enable processes of imagination towards anyone that uh, and of interpretations towards anyone that a render does not. And uh, when you do a render, the, the process of imagination and of relations and of interaction with that project is stopped, no? Because when you have, are showing a finished image, it is, uh, a, it is there, you know, it's, it's there, you see it, you uh, you immediately in unconsciously and consciously what me consciously but probably everybody uh, normally the, the the people would stop imagining no the place is designed it's there you can even see it no it's even inhabited there's people inside you know there's even the dog passing by that's it it's done um and i think that architecture should be able to enable a conversation and specifically when it's being produced, you know, uh, enable imaginations, enable imaginative, imaginaries in, in everyone's minds to really uh, represent them, be able to be a, a system or a tool to represent themselves. And if architecture doesn't do that uh, when it's already built, it is problematic but when it is in the process of it it's completely wrong you know because then you are not able to uh, to open channels in anybody else mrs mine no you are imposing your view the way you see it and that's it you don't allow anyone to enter that world anymore you know yeah. only as viewers but that is not what architecture needs to do architecture needs to open that possibility for the anyone to interpret it in and to take it as 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 its place no as its own uh, space of representation no that's a, that's a great answer and in the spirit of that I, i'm curious because uh, my understanding uh kind of looking into your work that you you have an enormous amount of respect and appreciation of uh, for local craftsmen and artisans and and that the the, the, the builders uh, and uh, the, the makers, the actual uh, labor force that produces your architecture uh, could at certain moments 
participate within the authorship of the work. I mean, I suppose there, there are many examples of how, uh, let's say, certain traditions that have been handed down uh, from one era to the next could be reinterpreted in, in, a, in a kind of contemporary way. Are, are there situations with some of your projects where that's the case? Where someone who's working with, with textiles or uh, ceramics or masonry uh, um, have been given a, a certain uh, uh, kind of rule set and, and yet they interpret it uh, according to their own interest. For sure, and this is one of the aims that I'm looking forward no? to understand how really to, since the first moment, I think I was informed by uh, the craftsmen that would build my buildings. I, I changed completely the idea on how I do architecture from a project I did in the very start of my practice. Uh, understanding who is going to build it no? and who were the hands that were going to build my 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 buildings and by establishing a dialogue with them no because at the end i am just creating an imaginary and they are going to create to do the physical creation of that imaginary no so how to include them in the as part of the process uh, which i haven't uh, arrived to uh, to a point where i feel that we have include them but we have started questioning that no but i think it's the same with a, every collaborator that we uh, that we um, ask to work with or we are asked to work with and or we include because we want uh, it's people that are uh, really taking part of it and being part of it important it's not that it's uh, someone that is doing what I want to do it's someone that is questioning what I want to do I think that is the only benefit of a collaboration no? someone that really can question what do you do right and I imagine that it, it's uh, incredibly rewarding when you don't know in advance what the outcome is going to be and 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 something totally unexpected emerges I never know what is going to be. I know what I'm going to do in the next couple of hours, but I never plan in advance because exactly the same. I think it's better. <laughs> are, are, Tatiana, are there artists or architects in your background? Yes, my my whole family, they're all ar uh, architects and, oh my and uh, I know. Uh, my grandfather was an architect. Uh, he was an, uh, a recognized architect in, in Bilbao. Yeah, my name is as oh. strange as it sounds, Bilbao from Bilbao. Yes. Um, and my grandfather was a recognized architect and politician uh, from uh, Bilbao. And he was part of the government of La República in the Civil War. And he was, um, so then he emigrated to Mexico. He was exiled to Mexico as a refugee. And uh, this is why I'm Mexican. Um, but I have this very com kind of strange combination of um, my uh, grandfather from the other side was an engineer and my grandmother from, from the, the, the wife of the, of the architect was a fashion designer. And wow. my, um, from the other side uh, was a technical engineer and a biologist uh, and they were Germans. So I have this kind of very strange combination of German Basque and being born in Mexico. So wow. <laughs> very wow. strange um, combination. But um, yeah, and in the, my father's side, then there is all these, um, there is always these family reunions and they say, okay, now we take a picture of everybody. We take a picture of the architects and it's half of the party. <laughs> it's in the picture. Have so yes. I come from a family of architects. Well, that's that's a beautiful story. Um, have you have you ever collaborated with family members? Yes, uh, we, unfortunately not with my grandfather. I never knew him. Uh, he died when my father was super young. He died when my father was eleven. But I think that I I had it in my blood, and uh, I had also an uh, an uncle that was a very we find architect, amazing educator as well, Jose Luis Benjure. And he, he was the husband of the sister of my dad. So, uh, but 
um, well, obviously, since I was born, he was my uncle, and um, he uh, he was very old already when I realized I wanted to be an architect. So I really grasped the last uh, years of his career, and uh, then he passed away, unfortunately, too early for me. I was just starting the um, oh, the the um, my studies, and uh, my cousins. They're all also there are several architects and we have collaborated in different ways in several projects. And one of the son, sons of my cousins is the head of my office, Juan Pablo. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I imagine so it's a family business. And my sister is my partner. It's a family <laughs> business. <laughs> wow. I opened a whole door there with that question. Yeah. Um, I imagine that the family dinners are very lively and have been since you were a young girl. Yeah. Do, do you think that your grandfather uh, uh, influenced you in the in the context of recognizing the the importance to uh, to be engaged with with organizations and, and you know you 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 held or may still hold an advisory position with the federal government? And I don't I don't still hold it, but yes, definitely. Um, I think my political be, uh, uh, deviation comes from my grandfather. I actually uh, kind of uh, not consciously uh, grew up with the idea of my grandfather as an architect. I grew up all the time with uh, my grandfather as a politician, as, as a part of a, uh, um, uh, a, is, he was a minister of the government of La Republica. So um, I grew up with his political ideas and obviously I grew up because of his political ideas in Mexico so that was an important uh, thing and um, so I grew up uh, uh, more conscious with that than with his architecture and I not I really didn't discover his architecture until I was studying architecture and yeah. then to discover that his architecture was also very political and incredibly social socially um, accounted so i yeah i definitely have it as a big influence you know it's inevitable that i that i ask you a question and you can answer it in any way you want but the the uh, frank gary project in bilbao do, what's your perspective on that project and because that's your homeland i think that is very successful in many ways and I think it also has been misinterpreted in many, in, in normally, no? So first of all, the thing is that the Guggenheim was not the only thing that created the transformation of Bilbao, uh, but it was definitely the cherry of the pie, you know? So, and actually it works as the cherry of the pie. It is a pie that is already super delicious, uh, but the cherry is the cherry, no? <laughs> and um, I have to say that, um, so since I was very little, I, I went to Bilbao and, um, and I wasn't aware how incredibly beautiful and, um, but most of all, surrounded by nature, this city is. Uh, I think that uh, when I grew up, this city was gray and I only could see this gray city. And when the Guggenheim arrived, all of a sudden, the moment uh, that, I, um, that I went to Bilbao when uh, the Guggenheim was just open, uh, all of a sudden, this city became this place in the middle of these beautiful mountains uh, with a river on the side, you know? And it was there all the time, but, uh, but the Guggenheim made you look towards the ends of city, of, of streets, that you would never do. And you would realize that they at the end of the city, not so far away because it's a small city, there's incredible nature or the river from one side or the trees of the mountain on the other side. And, um, and so I think that in that way, it really became very successful for the identity of the city, for the transformation of the identity of the city, uh, but also from the vision of the people from their own city. And I think that is uh, amazing. Right. And it's been an economic force or engine, right, to bring significant capital into the city. It's been also the cherry of the pie because what the Bilbao did is a regeneration plan that not many cities can do or are visionary enough to do. That uh, because Bilbao was basically a 
hyper industrialized place that depended in the uh, amazing industry that uh, the Basque country had. And when that became more um, homogeneous in the, in the country, so in Spain, the industry really, and also with all the trade um, openings with, the, with Europe and the other, uh, other countries, obviously the region lose uh, this uh, um, power of on relying on industry. Um, and then they they understood very early that they needed to transform the city into a uh, more service city. And by doing a very big infrastructure plan that connected uh, the towns around to really be served by Bilbao and established Bilbao as a service city, um, they wouldn't have done it. So if they, that is the, one of the misconceptions, no? that people think that you only do a beautiful museum with a lot of money and then you can transform an economy, which is not true. Uh, so it is an, a plan that comes in many stages from uh, a, allowing people to have a, a communication from that, a, expand the possibility of infrastructure into these towns, no? healthcare and and education, and then <clears throat> create projects that would really uh, detonate uh, different uh, types of um, programs in the river, in the areas that were industrial areas. And one of them is the Guggenheim of the Bilbao, and this is why it becomes very successful. Well, thank you. I mean, a, a lot of what you just said, I don't believe a lot of people know about that. Uh, no. Um, I don't see any questions from the student body because if they have one, they should send it in immediately. <laughs> um, but I know oh, we have one. Oh, look, look at this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you see these on your screen as well? Yes. Uh, why don't I... Uh, Uh, I think one really important phenomenon in our productivity centric society is the power of large scale collectivization. Labor movements in transitioning away from this institution oriented model toward a society focused on social relationships. What steps can we take to reduce exploitation at these more intimate subliminal levels where it might be harder to detect Control. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I I don't have a straightforward answer, but I what I think is that if we start establishing those relationships with our with our really close circle, then we were they are, we are unable to start to you know uh, um, decode those uh, possibilities to open different channels, no? And I think that that is what I was saying, establishing more social relationships, no? To establish a system that, for example, in COVID, many people did that, no? Um, you, uh, instead of, uh, you, after two months or three months of isolation, where people found that it was really impossible to be by yourself in your house with your four, three or whatever kids, I have five, um, it is really, the, I have five because I have a combined family. Eh? <laughs> Everybody went, wow, five. No, I have two uh, physically mine <laughs> and three others that life gave me uh, really as, as a gift. Um, so I, uh, when people started to understand how difficult it was to live, they started to create these pots, you know, of um, five households that were neighbors that probably would never knew each other before again, that one family would take care of the shopping, the other one would take care of the food, the other one would take care of the homeschooling, and the other one would take care of whatever. And then they would be able to all uh, sustain themselves and uh, do uh, work at the same time. These are things that we can start doing. Uh, in the in, even if it's not a pandemic, you know, it, it is way more sustainable if you uh, have, for example, with our neighbors, we already start they started doing that. No, we called each other. It's like I'm going to the supermarket. So then one person is exposed instead of the six families that we live in the building, no, and going by the supermarket every week. So I'm going to the supermarket. Make your lists. 
And then um, uh, you start already creating a system of social relationships that are enabling different things and possibilities that, um, that really open challenges, no? Because in next time, when I'm not here, I will call my neighbor that I already know because we establish a relationship by going to the supermarket, uh -huh. no? To take uh, my girl from school because I'm trapped in whatever thing, you know? Hey, Tatiana, I, I, I do want to... Uh restate this one this is from Mackie no question here but I want to thank you so much for speaking about women in the field as a Latina woman who has experienced sexist comments at work and even at school by critics I believe that it is super important to have outspoken women like you who will fight against those stereotypes and who will always stand up against that thank so. you that's yeah, a we all have to stand uh, and speak out about it. And that is the way we're going to eliminate these things. There's no other way. Um, this is from Samantha. I just want to start off by saying that I was super excited to see your lecture. I'm Mexican as well, and it's really inspiring to see such a successful Mexican architect. Rosanna Montiel and yourself have been big inspirations for me during my mm -hmm. architectural education. Currently, I'm a master's student, and my project this year is based on architecture's relationship with the social uh, and how we can strive to design for a more socially responsive and inclusive architecture. I was actually looking at some of your projects for my research. My question is, a lot of people think uh, it is not an architect's job to be involved politically. What would you say to those people? Well, architecture is politics. I don't see any, any way different, you know, creating a space is already, um, is already negotiating with many things that I, are politics. So um, that is what I would respond <laughs> is how can you divide it if architecture is already politics, you are mediating between you and someone else. So that is politics at its best. So I would say that to them. A great answer. Uh, Emily, I just, uh, what I, I, I believe Tatiana answered your question about beauty and ang ambiguity, but I do want to convey the fact that you thought it was an amazing lecture to Tatiana. Thank um, you. I don't see any other more questions. It's, it's almost 930. <laughs> uh, you've been incredibly generous and I'm sorry for the technological challenges that you've had to face. I can assure you that even though we're online and we're very far away and you don't see the faces of all the students, that this lecture has had impact. And like all great lectures and a great storyteller who tells the truth about the world, uh, you will have changed the minds and maybe even the lives of some of these students today. So on behalf of the entire school, I, I wanna personally thank you, Tatiana. Um, it's, it's an amazing uh, practice, and uh, I think it's going to start a revolution. <laughs> Let's and do a revolution. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Evan. It's been a, a wonderful night, and it's been very enriching, so I'm very happy to be able to be with you at least on this digital medium. And as I say, I hope and um, we are we are able to meet in person at some point and we will and 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 uh, the next time you get to yale and it may be in six months or 12 months uh, let's keep in touch because i'd be thrilled to to send a car pick you up and and bring you to the school for sure thank you thank you so well, much for your time and your thank insights. you very much we appreciate it good night thank you thank you good night everybody